Ladies and gentlemen, the revolution. Prince wanted a story based on his career. We said go. It was about creating a reality that an audience would respond to. Purple Rain is the pinnacle of the whole Prince and the Revolution experience. Nobody gave us two shots in hell to pull this off. Some people thought it was just a glorified music video. They were wrong. <laughs> it was a great movie. People realized that there was something special going on. The whole experience was over the top. had worked so hard on 1999, double record set, toured endlessly, and so he was at a point where he wasn't yet a superstar, but he was right at that point of doing it, so everybody was waiting, what's your next move going to be? Prince had been writing a movie for a few years. He was always walking around with his notebook and on the plane and thinking of things, and he's a really creative person. You know, so it was just brewing, it was ready to happen. There really was a Purple Notebook, and by early 1983, the word had spread in the camp that this writing was largely his ideas for the what turned out to be the script for Purple Rain. I remember Prince sitting me down, and he said, what would you think if we did a movie? And I said, a movie? And I go, really, that sounds exciting. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> that was about it. I said, great, let's go. <laughs> First, after I got over the initial shock of it, I thought it would be really cool, but I just didn't know going in, being a kid from the streets and stuff from the ghetto, I, you know, I didn't know what to expect. We knew it was going to be about us, and we knew there was going to be music in it, and you wanted to, to do a good job. It was your chance to shine, and you know, you wanted to do it. So I finally spoke to Prince. I said, what exactly are you after? He said, well, it's for, I'm being very specific. I want to star in a movie, I want my name above the title, and I want it to be at a major studio. And so began the saga. We were going to shoot this movie in Minneapolis. If we waited too long, winter would set in. So we decided to go ahead and we began hiring and setting up the film without a deal. Bob Cavallo was now looking for someone to helm Prince's first feature. We were first-time producers, first-time actors, shooting in the fall and perhaps winter in Minneapolis. I went to every director in town. And they all, of course, passed. And eventually I heard about a director named Jamie Foley who went to screen his film. And they offered Jamie the opportunity to make the movie. He subsequently passed on the script and told the producer that he should talk to me about directing it since I had done a film at USC about jazz musicians and music was kind of the thing that I was into. So we just said, okay, Albert, you're it. And I was shocked to learn that he had passed. <laughs> I stared at the phone for about five minutes and then I picked up the phone again and I called Bob Cavallo back and I said, listen, I think you and I should meet. A week later we meet and instead of having a script with him, he actually shoots the movie verbally in and full voice, kneeling, jumping up and down, in the aisles. Uh, I, everyone heard his take on the movie. And I got excited, I almost cheered at the end. It was so clever. Prince originally was just thinking of the film as being more a cult kind of thing, just a rock film, you know, just this, we were this weird family in Minneapolis, and these people that just had a thing going on, you know, that we were gonna make a movie about. But Al Magnoli said to Prince, if you're gonna make a movie, let's make a hit movie. When you're around somebody with as clear a vision and the kind of unbridled ambition and focus that Prince has for anything he believes in, it, it is kind of intoxicating. All of a sudden, Prince has a meeting with us and says that we gotta go to acting school, we gotta go to these dance lessons and stuff. And so, it's like, okay, it's a little bit different than playing the drums, but, you know. <laughs> And the whole group of us, oh, too, like the just jazz ridiculous. dance class. Yeah, it was just <laughs> like your jazz hands. It was a very surreal experience, but uh, we were very prepared nonetheless. We were all different ages and at different periods of our lives, and, I mean, it was a movie on its own. 
This was Wendy's first. I was out of high school. Band, you know, like, okay, here, Purple Rain. I uh, heard through the grapevine that uh, you had a new tune written by a couple great girls. Did you hear it? The people in the film from our camp were literally playing themselves. So here's an opportunity for guys like Jesse Johnson and Jerome Benton and Morris Day and Wendy and Lisa and Bobby Z to kind of play out their personas. And Prince encouraged that. We wanted it to be sort of the Prince story without it being the Prince story, which was exciting for us. Al Magnoli was calling everybody in and saying, here's where Prince is going with these ideas and let's come up with some scenarios that would make sense to you and your relationship to him. You should know by now that we wouldn't put a dark cloud over your head. So the conflicts that are shown in the movie that Wendy and Lisa have with Prince and the rest of the bandmates was real. So that became a core element to the aspect of the movie and the genesis of their relationship. The thing I remember about Prince, though, back in that day, was that he was the hardest working person ever. Prince was at his peak. The music was unlike anything else, and it just lifted the movie up. He produced way more than he released or played for anybody. Prince asked me if I would come by and listen to some of the music that he had been accumulating for this particular picture. Essentially, he had 100 songs fully produced. The amazing thing about it is that in those 12 songs that I ultimately picked, Purple Rain did not exist yet. We were very close to starting shooting and we didn't have our girl yet. I'd say we saw anywhere between 500 and 1,000 women between Los Angeles and New York. And they all arrived with the vanity look, you know, leather, stiletto boots and everything else. It was fantastic. But the interesting thing is Apollonia shows up wearing just the baggiest sweats. And what came through in the interview with her was just that she was very sweet, tremendously accessible. So I called up Prince and I said, listen, I think we just got lucky here. You know, in the 11th hour, as this usually is, I, I, I have someone here that's just terrific. She's a nice girl, but she was the actress. None of us had acted before. She was very beautiful and just perfect for the part. We were set to start shooting November 1st. The crews were all into Minneapolis. We were ready to go. And the producer very wisely said, is there anything you can shoot in these next couple of days, you know? And I said, well, I don't want to shoot any dialogue, but if you get me a helicopter, we can shoot all of the motorcycle shots. The music, Take Me With You, was written specifically with that in mind. That wasn't part of the hundred songs that he had given me originally. nice scene. It's one of the only like scenes that's outdoors and you get that feeling of like release. Yeah, just a breakaway. I think the temperature was about 68, 69. It was gorgeous, beautiful autumn day. After those two days, the temperature plummeted to about 20 degrees. And we then started our production with Apollonia having to jump into the lake. And I went up to her and I said, you know, you're jumping into the water. It's 20 below zero. She goes, okay. <laughs> We had skim divers under the water just to make sure she did not come up. She could have had hypothermia. It was, it was seriously cold in that time. I went to her and I said, so what are the chances of getting you back in there and actually filming the rest of the scene, which is you coming out? And she said, that isn't going to happen. So it was decided on the spot that she would dive into the water in Minneapolis and reemerge weeks later in Los Angeles. Winter was the biggest challenge in doing this whole project. Gasoline froze during that period of time. That's how cold it was some days. And you'd get up at four and start the car. And go then back go in, in the, the house, house and take a shower and get dressed. It was insane. And then you'd go chip your windshield off. Like, it was insane. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the revolution. When he wrote The Beautiful Ones, we were in LA, and I remember going, you're so tall. 
totally in tune right now with your creativity. You are so on a roll. I just remember hearing that song and thinking to myself, God, you're so good. You are so good at this. Every song he writes, he's dealing from an emotional core. As his professionalism is unwavering, uh, his love of his music is unwavering. To watch a human being be that creative and that visionary was uh, a true, true gift to get to see that. So I feel very fortunate. Prince wrote all this incredible music, and I was determined to see that it was going to be used in the context of a pretty good story. Around. You're a goddamn sinner! Shut up! Clarence Williams especially, the minute he came onto the set, created a kind of professionalism that the non-actors, the musicians, hadn't seen before. You're crazy! Shut up, Dad! Immediately, you can see how people just were on the set to watch Clarence work. He's detail-oriented, so it's about the clothing, it's about his hair, it's about the gun in his hand, it's about everything has to add up for him. So Prince really reacted to Clarence, and, you know, Clarence pretty much nailed it. In the scene where Prince coming in, seeing his father playing piano, and he asks his son... You gonna get married? I don't know. Now that was a moment that Prince had discussed with me, that that had happened to him when he was a kid. And so when I heard that, we used it and put that into the picture and created that moment. I suppose the biggest question left unanswered about Purple Rain was just how true to biography the movie really was. I can just say that a lot of it dealt with stuff that had happened or almost happened in his life. So it's that kind of professionalism of Clarence wanting to hook into that and Prince wanting to hook into that, and then all of us getting involved in creating that scene. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the time. I won't see you no more. Tell me when we're ready. Y'all better do this one. I understood that in Minneapolis there was this friction between bands. And sure enough, I mean, right away, you know, you had Prince and the Revolution and you had time. Morris, too hot day. <laughs> Morris day. What people don't know about Morris is Morris is one of the best drummers that you could ever see. And uh, one of the funniest cats <laughs> of all time, just naturally. Back when we first started, Prince would stand on the side of the stage. He'd crack up, he'd love it. Then he'd realize, oh man, I gotta go on stage now. And I gotta follow, follow these that. guys, you know. <laughs> They're comedians anyway, so <laughs> it just it got transferred to film. I mean, I see that every day, you know, when I'm with them. I mean, that's how they are. You can tell with certain actors how much they can telegraph without saying a word. And I think Jerome had the most talent for that. Even though he didn't have as many lines, but there was a he could telegraph volumes. JB. Well, JB happens to be my brother. Another funny guy, just naturally. When you put him and Morris Day on the same stage, it's fire. It's hot. It's hot. The most interesting thing about Purple Rain to me was that the timeliness of it. It actually captured a music revolution as it was happening. Basically, we were doing prints as things really were. The time were really part of his life, and the revolution were his band. The whole idea of, here's the club, we got three slots and four bands. Somebody ain't making, that is very true. There was a little bit of a rivalry there in real life. That whole Minneapolis struggle of, you know, who's the funkiest? Who's the baddest? We would all battle one another for the same work. So, you know, you go out one week and you get your butt tore up, and then you have to go rehearse and come back the next week and try to make amends. That's the way it was back then in Minneapolis. Very competitive. I got three acts. 
I don't need four. So that means one of y'all have got to go. I mean, what would you do in my position? I was just in a point in the picture where I realized that I needed to do a montage, and I needed a song for that. I called Prince up and I said, I need a new song. And I said, this is about your father, about your relationship with your father and your mother. It's about loss, redemption, salvation. It's about the themes that we're talking about in this picture. He said, okay. And the next morning, I get a phone call from him. And he goes, okay, I got two songs for you. Dig if you will the picture of you and I engaged in a kiss. There's not too many artists who you could say, well, look, we really need a first single, Prince. We need it to be a big hit in both urban and pop radio. And all these other songs in the movie work great, but they're not a great first single. He says, okay. <laughs> and then he gives us Dove's Cry. So then Prince calls me and says, you like the song? And I go, yeah. And he goes, will you back me? Because now they're telling me I have to add more instruments and you know, I have to essentially make it a real song. And I'm going, no, I'll back you. This is the song. So that's the song that you hear is the one he developed and created. That's how When Doves Cry got made. Doves Cry turned out to be number one in every chart. We had it out 10 weeks before the movie, so we had this number one record for a long time before the film came out. When Doves Cry, the sadness of it, I think it's, it's a testament to his writing for a particular scene in advance and, and, and visualizing the whole concept. The thing that kind of propelled everyone else around him to make that combination of the film and the record and the tour kind of all at the same time is that the songs were so good. Well, for me personally, I really like Darling Nikki, I think, out of all the performance numbers. Prince is just, he's all over the board on that one, dancing around and... It's just a, it's a great performance. I knew a girl named Nikki, I guess you could say she was a sex fiend. I met her in a hotel lobby, masturbating with a magazine. It's supposed to make Apollonia upset and cry. And I said, is it okay that it's a, it's a darling Nikki? He says, what, do you want to be darling Apollonia? <laughs> Sometimes when he's alone, especially, he can just reach these places that are just unbelievable with his, and with his screaming, there's, he's really an impressive there's only, screamer. There's only a few people that can scream like that. He was talking about Really? The interesting thing about meeting Prince was I recognized in him a tremendous vulnerability. And I realized that combination of artistry and vulnerability was exactly an ingredient that I could use and bring something meaningful to the screen. The scene where he's in the basement and he's going through... He finds his father's, finds his music. father's music. And it, the, the look on his face. I've, I've only seen that look on his face a couple times, and it's a powerful moment when you see a tear well up in his eyes. It was very important to him to get whatever he wanted to tell of that story across to people and to connect all those parts into, into him, to show, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and I think he did a good job, it did, it did show. Yeah, he did. There's an audience out there that wants truth, and they don't want something that is manufactured by the Hollywood elite. So when you say, how does this stuff happen? Neither one of us know. It's just part of understanding the nature of the material and then doing the work necessary to bring that to the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, the revolution. Prince came to us with just the essence of Purple Rain, the chord changes, and then he had us just work our own parts around the changes. 
it all so happened all at the same time, and I remember that day. It was on Highway 7. Highway okay. 7, that's right. I started playing this chord, with this being the root note, so I had this on the top, and then we tried to change the chord, so I was like... And Prince's chords at the time were much more simpler than I don't think it had that root at oh, the time. Oh, the suspended notes. I kept all those suspended chords in there. And then put the ninth in there. perfect song for that band. I just kind of called everybody into almost like their perfect role. You know, role. This was the Absolutely. Like kind of it really did. summed up kind of what the band was at that time. My favorite track will always be Purple Rain. The opening chords to the final sustain, it captivates me and I just I feel it definitely was part of history. Purple Rain. That woman with the the bicycle. Oh, right. The was she a homeless woman that yeah, came in there? And she, she was, was just watching crying rehearsal or, and crying she when heard we were the writing music. this song. I mean, we went outside on a break and she was out there crying. It was very yeah, odd. It was, it was a really <laughs> heavy day. I remember that. That's wow. so weird. I hadn't thought about that woman. Yeah, this homeless yeah. woman came just came into the warehouse with her bicycle while we were working at Purple Rain. <laughs> she just stayed there for hours watching us work the song yeah. out. And when we all walked outside, she was just bawling. And that's all we ever knew of her. Yeah. She left. She, left. But she was the Purple Rain Lady. Yeah. yeah. Purple Rain especially is just this epic kind of song, you know. It's still inspiring to this very day. It's anthemic, and everybody was blown away by it being so powerful and Ballady at the same time. Those are undeniable big lighter songs. So, I mean, you know, in answer to everybody's question in the world, did Wendy and Lisa write Purple Rain? No. But did we help? Yeah. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. <laughs> The performance scenes were probably the most magical for me. All the stage presentations, all the club scenes is in First Avenue. And I was told that with the number of songs we had to shoot, that it's probably about, you know, a month or two of shooting. The cinematographer, Don Thorne, said, well, then what we have to do is get four or five cameras. We shot all the music, not only Prince's, but other people's, the, the time and the... Apollonia 6 in um, a week. But the way the performances were staged and shot, I think was something that was new to film. We approached it as a rock concert. The groups got on stage with the particular lighting set up in a particular stage setting at that time. We shot every song essentially two times, four cameras per song, so it gave me eight camera setups for each song. All the smoke, lighting, everything had to happen on cue because we didn't have the time to go back and finesse if there was any true problem. The stuff that was done in the club was terrific. I mean, just mesmerizing. And everything that had taken place in that concert which seemed to have a, a fabulous air of spontaneity and give and take and this and down, down to every move had been structured, planned, rehearsed. Prince was working with us on the choreography and showing us what he wanted to do and how he wanted us to move. And we just rehearsed extensively leading up to those uh, performance uh, sections of the movie. Before we'd shoot, you know, he'd turn around to us and he'd be like, you know, we're going to kill it, you know? Like, everybody go for it, right? Come on. Like, come on. <laughs> and we'd be like, yeah, don't worry, man. We're there. We're for you. So yeah. it was good. Camaraderie, it was. good spirit. We were prepared, and it was a film, and you knew it was a film, and you were giving 100 percent, and you know people were going equally as nuts, you know, for the playback as they would be for a live performance. So it was, 
It was very exciting. Really gave you a sense of actually being in the club. And in a movie that's so music heavy, it was important that it was done right. It was shot correctly. And that was a case where it was shot correctly and edited correctly. Al, I think, bowed to Prince at that time. It was like, yeah. just give me your performance. Yeah. Just do just it. Turn roll. the cameras on. Roll. Camera here, camera here, here, yeah. here, here, here. Go. And just let Prince do it. Conventional wisdom told us it couldn't be done. And because I particularly didn't know any better, and neither did Prince and neither did the, the producers at the time, Bob Cavallo and his team, we just forged ahead and did what we did and um, got it done in 10 days. I didn't know if there was an audience out there, uh, apart from maybe a big weekend with a lot of young people. There was no precedent for this. Rock and roll stars with a couple of hit albums did not make major movies let alone somebody from the black community having the gumption to try to do it in the mainstream. I mean, let's don't forget that aspect of it. So there was still some apprehension as to how the thing was going to be received by critics, and more importantly, by the public. Marketing told me we're going to screen it in front of essentially a white audience. And within about a minute or two, literally, the entire audience was on their feet. So one of the Warner executives comes running up to me and he says, they're on their feet, they're screaming, what does it mean? And I said, I think it means they like the movie. And he goes, great. So then they began to think, well, wow, maybe we should open this in more theaters than we thought. So we went from 200 as a planned release to 900 theaters, and that first weekend, we were number one at the box office. But the premiere was here, here in LA, at the Grove Chinese, Chinese Theater. It's <laughs> theater that I grew up going to as a kid, so that was a trip for me. And yeah. It was exciting because fans were in the audience as well. It wasn't just a closed screen. In that way, it was kind of overwhelming because of the audience response. And it was sitting there, there and, there, and people kept looking at us and looking at the screen. <laughs> Very surreal. I just remember that's the most stars I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Once the movie hit and we saw the response, then it really was the overnight success that everybody thinks things are. It was also the kind of movie that people went back and saw it again and again and again, started quoting lines from the movie. It was interesting because Purple Rain kind of documented his rise to the next level at a timely part where it was still developing, it was still happening, where people were, you know, he had, you know, a million fans, two million fans. He went from two million fans to ten million fans. On top of which, he won Academy Award for song score, which he richly deserved. We had already had a taste of some of that star treatment and fame previous to Purple Rain, but nothing like what greeted us after the movie came out and the album. We got to spend the next handful of years being in a great funk rock band and being together and doing this whole thing. It was just it was great for us. It was great. One thing that was fantastic about this entire experience, it was always about making a decision based on making the movie at best it could be. It's a good picture. It demonstrated that rock and roll can support a serious motion picture. It was not only in sync with what was going on, but could actually define it and propel it into the next yeah. thing. And that's Prince. And it was. That's Prince. Yeah. I think Purple Rain set a benchmark for pop movies. I think we're still waiting to see it matched. In terms of the core relationship and artistry and understanding of one another, it was effortless. And it made the journey terrific. It was one of the greatest experiences of my life. Even though it was hard work and we were there for long hours, I found it to be overall just a lot of fun. It was so much fun for everybody but me. <laughs> because I was worried about where we're going to finish on time. We had a lot to do, and we did it. <laughs>